praise your name. Let's continue to lift up his name today with one accord. to remind everybody, I just found out this past week what is supposed to take place July 23rd through the 25th. I had no idea. I was waiting with anticipation. It's going to be camp. How many is excited about camp? It's been two years in the making. I want to invite everybody to sign up for camp. Please see Sister Lena. She doesn't know that you're going to go see her, but uh, uh, Brother Cora and I decided to throw her under the bus. She's going to take care of... Uh, sign-ups today. So if you're thinking about it, sign up with Sister Lana. We get your name on the list. Going to have a great time. Looking forward. God always does such great, wonderful things at camp. Amen. So let's go before the Lord in prayer, asking God's blessing. 
upon us today. Let's lift up our pastor in prayer that God would touch him in his body. Unspoken needs by the uplifted hand. God sees every need and every request. Email us today with your spiritual requests, your prayer needs, and we'll be happy to lift them up before the throne of God on your behalf. I'm going to ask Brother Art Brum, if he would, to take us before the Lord on behalf of the remainder of our service today, Brother Art. Won't you just ask me, God, to rain your spirit down upon us this day, Lord. Help us to open our hearts, Lord, and take in what you have for us this very day. God, Lord, all the requests that are represented here, we ask you to move on each and every request. Lord, bless Brother Thomas as he speaks at this time, Lord. Let us hear what you would have us hear in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Greet, right. Wink at somebody next to you, bump elbows, whatever you want to do. God bless you. You may be seated. Eventually, we'll be back to slapping high fives and stuff like that, right? So you guys remember all of the uh, special announcements. I'm just going to jump right into this. Uh, i got a, a little bit of a different message today. It's, it's a word to challenge me and to challenge, hopefully, somebody here today. We're going to begin in 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, beginning with the uh, first verse. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand. Are you so thankful for that gospel message that you received? Are you so thankful for the message of Jesus Christ and Him crucified? Do you appreciate what God has sacrificed for each and every one of us so that we could have life and we could have it more abundantly? Isn't that so wonderful and marvelous? This is Paul talking to the church of Corinth that he established in, back in Acts, I believe is the 18th uh, chapter. And this is him. There were those who rose up and uh, was beginning to say that they accept part of the gospel message, but not this part of the gospel message. And this is Paul reaching out to them, saying, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, wherein you stand. It's the same gospel message that he gave to them at the beginning. It's the same gospel message that he's speaking to them right now. And that is the gospel message that they had once received. It says in the word, by which ye are saved. You are saved by that gospel message. If you keep in memory, if you pay attention to what I taught to you at the beginning, keep that in memory unless you have believed in vain. Did you believe what I preached the very first time to you? Or have you changed from what I preached to you the very first time into something else? Because if you've changed it into something else, your faith is vain. It is empty. It's without a reason. It's without a cause. For I delivered it unto you, this is Paul saying, I delivered it to you, church of Corinth, as I have also received it, how that Christ died for our sins, how? According to the scriptures, according to the word of God, according to this promise, according to this holy book, that's where he gave the message from, that he was buried and that he rose again on the third day, according to the scriptures. This is the first proof that Paul gives in his argument to those that are wanting to change the gospel from what he originally preached to them. It is from the same scriptures that it was from the first time. The Old Testament scriptures and whatever letters and everything that may have been available at this time. And he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that, he was seen above about 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present day, but some have fallen asleep. It is that same gospel message that he was buried and that he rose again according to the scriptures. Here is the second proof that Paul gives to these. He's talking about who the apostles, the 12 apostles, the 12 disciples, their witness and their testimony. And not only then, if they're not good enough, there's 500 other individuals that saw the resurrected Christ to know that Jesus Christ was resurrected from the dead. He's no longer in the grave. And some of that 500, the greater amount of that 500, which means over 250, because that's a greater amount, right? Greater than half is still alive today, and they will testify of the same things, of the same gospel that I gave to you at the beginning. Praise the Lord. Yeah. For I, if let's say that's not enough, and at last was seen also of me, this is Paul testifying of himself, I also saw him as one who was born out of due time, for I am the least 
of the apostles. Notice he is associating himself as one of the apostles. So therefore, Paul is coming under the authority of the apostleship of one of Jesus Christ. So he's not only just saying something, he has the authority of the apostleship. I don't have that authority. I'm not an apostle. I don't carry that. I don't have it. But I'm just coming to you as someone to share the good news of the gospel and share what Paul has said here. But he's saying, if you can't stand on the scriptures, if you can't stand upon the eyewitnesses and the original 12 disciples, then stand on my authority as an apostle of Christ when I delivered this message unto you. Because I persecuted the church of God. If it wasn't enough, Paul brings all these proofs. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace was bestowed upon me. And it was not in vain. It was with a cause. It was with a reason. It was not empty. And I have labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which is in me and with me. Therefore, whether it were I or they, who is they? They being the other 12 apostles. They being the 250 plus witnesses. Whether I or they preach, so ye believed. You received the word and you believed it. And this word is what made you saved. But now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? This is the gospel message that Jesus Christ bled, died, arose on the third day. He's no longer in the grave. You received it. You were saved by it. How is it that some of you now are coming back and saying Jesus was not raised from the dead? Where are you getting this from? Because if they're, they're, what they're saying is, I accept this part of the salvation plan. I accept this part of the gospel. I accept this. I accept and believe that Jesus was the son of God. I accept and believe that I repented and my sins are forgiven me. But this whole resurrection of the dead stuff, I don't believe in that. I'm not buying into that. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? And here he goes into what happens if there is no resurrection of the dead. Now, if Christ... But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. Stands to reason, right? If Jesus Christ didn't rise from the dead, Christ is still in the grave. He has not risen. And if Christ be not risen, then our preaching is vain. Everything that we talked about is empty. Everything we talked about is void. It has no purpose. It has no cause. It has no rhyme. It has no reason. And your faith also is empty and has no rhyme, no reason, nor cause. It is emptiness in vain. Yea, we are found as false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ whom he raised not up, and if so, that the dead rise not. Now he's saying, if Christ did not be raised from the dead, now all of us, the scripture, all of us, the 500 witnesses, All of us, the apostles, are blasphemers and heretics if God did not raise Christ up from the dead. That's what he's saying here. We we are false writers who Christ raised not be dead. Let's go uh, verse 16. For if the dead rise not, then is Christ not raised? And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, and you are still in your sin. You are still in your sins. But I accept that, that uh, my sins are being forgiven. If Christ has not been raised from the dead, you are still in that sin. It puts null and void every other part of the gospel that you're trying to hold on to. The gospel message is not an a la carte message. It's not a pick and choose. I'm going to take this and take that. No, it's a full, complete message in the beauty and the splendor and awe of Almighty God from the beginning of days all the way until the end. It's the same full and complete gospel message. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. I'm never going to see. Man, we we, we are comforted by that, knowing that we're going to see our loved ones once again and that we're all going to be with Christ forever. Never going to see them again. Once they die, that's it. That's the end of it. And if in this life we only have the hope in Christ, we are all men most miserable. Our hope is empty and we are pathetic. 
But praise be to God, Christ is now risen from the dead. He is no longer in the grave. He is alive and well today. And he has become the first fruits of them that have slept. And what does that mean? That means that he is no longer in the grave. That means my faith has purpose. My faith has a cause. That means my sins have been forgiven me. That means I'm going to see all my brothers and sisters together someday. That means I'm going to have a life more abundantly, and so I will be caught up in the air, and so shall I ever be with the Lord. Praise the Lord. Paul is speaking to them with these proofs, with these things that were sure providing the inverse of the effect of what they were talking about, realizing how foolish it was that Christ was dead and he lives again and he reigns forever as King of kings and Lord of lords. And that's a part of the full gospel message. I can't just take bits and pieces. The word of God says in Isaiah, it's upon precept upon precept. It's here a little and there a little. And it's all put together in a beautiful package. How many appreciate the gospel message of Jesus Christ? Every aspect of it. Praise the name of the Lord. And here is what God ministered and spoke into my heart. Found Jude in the third chapter. Said, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and to exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. What is that common salvation? Well, it's, it's the facts of the gospel, right? It's the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's without the shedding of blood. There is no remission of sins. It's about Jesus Christ shedding his blood so that I can have forgiveness of my sins when I repent. It says that when I'm baptized, I'm baptized into his death, that I shall be resurrected from the dead and that his likeness being filled with his spirit mortified by the baptism of the Holy Ghost. It's not common because it's plain. It's not common because it's simple. It's not common because it's base. It's common because it's the same gospel message yesterday. It's the same gospel message today. It's the same gospel message that's going to be spoken tomorrow. It's the same gospel message at Heartland Christian Camp in 1985. It's the same gospel message here at the Master's House on May 16th, 2021. It's the same gospel message July 21st through the 25th or 23rd through the 25th it's going to be that same gospel message there as it's the same gospel message here. It's that same gospel message in Colorado. It's the same gospel message in these United States of America. It's the same gospel message in every nation, in every creed, in every language, in every race, in every people, in every place, in everything, in culture, in ideology, in anything else. It's the same message today as it was back in and that is Jesus Christ and him crucified they used to sing a song around here there's only one 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 way to God there's only one 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 way to God I don't know if they used to sing it but I remember it somewhere and that is baptized in Jesus name when you don't know what to do just say Jesus they sing the song today one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through us all and in us all. Praise the Lord. What is that contending for the faith? What does that mean? It means to fight and struggle against every spiritual opposition to our faith. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual weakness in high places. Everything, everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of Jesus Christ that is ideologies, that is social media, that is movements, that is cultures, and that's false narratives that lift up against the narrative of Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Those are the things that we contend against. Those are the spiritual weapons that we need from Almighty God to fight against. Our assistant pastor, Brother Corbett, says, I'm not fighting this warfare as one that fights this warfare in the kingdom of the flesh. I fight this warfare in the kingdom of God. And what does that mean? How am I to contend? How am I to fight, the good new, fight for the good news of Jesus Christ? It says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God, through the pulling down of the strongholds. I asked the Lord, what is it that I'm supposed to be doing in this contention against these false narratives and things? And this is the word that he dropped into my heart in 1 Peter 3.15. It says, sanctify the Lord God in your heart. Sanctify me in your heart and be ready always, 
always in season and out of season to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and with fear. Not in the physical world where I'm ready to punch you in the nose for saying something against Jesus, but in humility and meekness of the spirit, boldness in the anointing, but humble in spirit and not be afraid to speak those things. You say, well, nobody's asking me a question. Nobody's specifically asking me a question about the gospel message. I'm telling you, there are hearts and there are minds that are crying out to God, and it may not be a spoken word that you can hear, but the Spirit of the Lord can hear them crying out to God, and it's my responsibility not to be silent. It's my responsibility to answer those questions and talk about the goodness of God, to talk about what He did for me, to talk about His Word, because His Word is truth today, and we can stand upon it. I don't care what lifts up itself. Even maybe somebody as, as in the church of Corinth that they wanted to change the gospel. I've got to be able not to punch them in the nose, but I got to be able to tell them, let me tell you what, look at all these proofs about the truth of God's word and his gospel message. No matter where I'm at, consider this, Jesus, that's all he did. That's all Jesus did was talk about the good things of God and how he loved you and how he cared about you and how he wanted to minister to you and heal you and do all these great things. He talked about the kingdom of God and that it was yours and that he wanted to do all these things for you. And how do they treat him? We can look to Jesus. He is the author and the finisher of our faith for the joy that was set before him. He endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For let's consider Jesus, who endured such a contradiction of sinners against himself. Let's be wearied and faint in our own minds. Think about the price that Jesus paid. I have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. I have not yet resisted unto blood, speaking the words of the reason of hope that is inside of me. But the time may come. Amen. In Matthew the 10th chapter, did I think that I was above the Lord? Did I think that somehow that I was going to be able to skate through without any persecution or I was going to be able to skate through without having any any heartache or pain just by speaking the good news of the gospel. The disciple is not greater than his master, the servant above, nor is the servant above his Lord. It is enough for the disciple that he be as his master and the servant as his Lord. If they called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more shall they call them of his household? If they said Jesus was of the devil, if they said Jesus was a blasphemer, what do you think they're going to say about us? They're going to say the exact same things. But here is the words of Jesus to his disciples. Here is the words of Jesus to me today. Fear them not, whether they say it or not. For there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed and hid that shall not be known. The truth of the gospel message will not be hid and it shall be known. The city upon a hill shall not be hid. Praise God. Praise what? I tell you in darkness that you speak in the light and what you hear in the ear that you preach on the housetop. When the Lord gives a word, when the Lord ministers to your heart through that gospel message, that is what you speak of the reason of your hope. That is what you tell them. Let me tell you about how good God is. Let me tell you about how he loved me. And not only so do I just say it, but I need to stand up on the housetop and say, glory to God, Jesus loves you. Glory to God, Jesus will forgive you. Glory to God, all of these great and wonderful things. He's your hope. He's your strength. Even if I stand up on my own housetop and deliver the gospel message that Jesus gave me, but I know what they're going to say. I know what they're going to say about me. It's going to be the same thing that was said about you. They're going to say that. But you're telling me I need to speak. You're telling me I need to open up my mouth. You're telling me I need to shout it from the housetop. Again, Jesus says to them, Fear not them which will kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. I don't have to be afraid of them. Even if I have to go all the way and be persecuted unto death for the gospel message of Jesus Christ, so be it. I don't have to be afraid of it. Fear not, because I am with you. Don't be afraid of those things. Fear him. Do I got to be afraid of God? Yes. I need to have that godly, reverent fear of the Lord. I am in awe of him today. How about you? Amen. Praise the Lord. Twice Jesus says here, do not fear. God has not given us the spirit of fear. He's given us his spirit, right? Power, love, and sound mind. 
We need to stand upon the promises of God. If Jesus also said it in another passage, says, I'm telling you these things, Jesus said to his disciples, why? So when these things come to pass, your faith will be elevated and you'll be able to believe. I'm telling you these things to speak my word and truth and these things will come to pass and you know it and you'll see it. Why is it so important? Because if Paul didn't speak the message to those children at Corinth, they could have ruined the whole church at that time. But he took the time to speak the gospel message and repeated what he had already said. Sometimes you got to go back to the altar twice, right? Sometimes I got to hear it a second time. Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing, and one of them shall not fall to the ground without your father? But the very hairs of your head are all numbered by God. Praise the Lord. Mine is a diminishing number, but that's all right. Jesus is doing subtraction. He's not doing ad addition or multiplication. Lord, maybe that's my prayer. I got to come back to the altar two or three times. Let's change that math, right? <laughs> no, that's not the point. The point is that he knows. Amen. Praise the Lord. Fear ye not a third time. Ye as more, you are more valuable than many sparrows. God sees the place that I'm at. The third time he told me not to be afraid. But if I will confess the name of Jesus, I will confess the gospel message. I need to confess that message. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess before my Father which is in heaven. You know that? If I'm silent, that is the exact same thing as me denying Jesus. Amen. I know we're not going to get up there and say, well, I deny that the Lord was raised from the dead, and I, I, I deny that he died on a cross and all that, those things. But if I don't say something in response to those that are speaking against the gospel, it is the same as me not confessing it. It's the same as me denying it. As it says right here in the scripture, for whosoever shall deny me before men, either in action or in silence, him also will I deny before my Father which is in heaven. I don't, want to, but I don't want to offend anybody, right? I don't want to, I don't want to upset anybody. I don't want to say something that, that's going to be an offense. What did Jesus say? Think not that I came to send peace on the earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father and the daughter against her mother and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's foe shall be them of his own household. I don't want to say anything because I don't want to offend my sister. I don't want to say anything because I don't want to offend my brother. No, we need to speak the truth of the gospel message. Praise the Lord Jesus. Do you love God more? That is the question. He that loveth the father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He that loveth the son... Or the daughter more than they love me is not worthy of me. He that taketh not up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. Will I take up my cross and follow Jesus all the way to Golgotha? Will I crucify my fear? Will I crucify my will? Will I crucify my flesh and let God's spirit rise up within me and pull me out of this grave? There's a song that I've been listening to that talks about get up, get up, get up. Get up out of this grave. Get up, get up, get up, get up out of this grave. Have I dug myself a grave and I'm comfortable there? I'm relaxed there. Well, the Spirit of God is saying, get up out of that grave. I called you out of that darkness. I called you out of that sin. I called you out of that death into life. Come up out of that grave into life, into the glory of Almighty God. The church is not dead. The gospel message is not dead. The truth of God is alive today. The truth of God should be alive today in our heart. As our pastor says, let the church be the church and let the church rise. Get up out of the grave, church. Get up out of that grave and let the gospel of Jesus Christ be preached from one end of this world all the way to the other. For the word of God says, the gospel the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. Then shall the end come. It will not come before that. He that findeth his life shall lose it, and he that loseth his life for my name's sake shall find it. Sister Courtney, there's a pair of ducks for you. That's actually a paradox if you paid attention to Bible study a couple weeks ago. I just want to say a pair of ducks. 
He that receiveth you receiveth me. He that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. The earned verse is also true. He that does not receive you does not receive Christ. If he does not receive Christ, does not receive him who sent Christ. Ah, uh, this I know, that if I have received Jesus Christ, and this I believe, we have received the truth. The word of God says that you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. How many people nowadays are quoting this scripture and there's so many different settings, and there's so many different belief systems, and all the things that they're standing for, and they quote this scripture. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free, shall set you free. They keep, they keep quoting this scripture. The truth in us has made a transformation from who we once were. Praise God. I am no longer the same. The truth of the gospel message means I'm no longer going to be the same. It means, it means I'm going to be transformed into a new creature. What freedom that they're talking about is not a government program. That freedom that they're talking about is not some intellectual thing that all of a sudden you're, the, the light bulb is going to turn on. The freedom that the scripture is talking about is I'm no longer bound by the law of Praise sin and God. death which means my sins have been forgiven me because Jesus Christ took my sins to the cross. And when I ask for repentance, he says, you're forgiven. And then he filled me with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And now his spirit lives inside of me and transformed me into a new creature. That is the truth that makes us free. It's his Holy Spirit within us. There were, it's the baptism of the Holy Ghost doing that transformation. But not all those who say the truth are members and keepers of the truth. Jesus was praying for his disciples. In John the 17th chapter, in the 17th verse, he said, sanctify them through thy word. What was the very first proof? It was the scriptures. It was the word of God. We've been having a Bible study of why it's so important for us to be in the word of God. Sanctify them through thy truth. And then the end of that scripture is, thy word is truth. Praise the Lord. I appreciate Sister Jeanette as she spoke two Wednesday nights ago, and she talked about what Bible does she carry with her? What word of God does she carry with her? And she pointed, she didn't have a book in her hand, she pointed to her heart and said, this is the Bible that I take with me everywhere. And then she quoted the scripture from the psalmist that said, thy word, thy word is truth, that I've hid in my heart, that I might not sin against you, that I might be able to stand, and having done all that I can to stand against the wiles of the enemy, stand and walk in truth. If God's word is in your heart, if it is fully encompassed in your heart, the word of God says what? From the mouth, from the heart. The mouth speaketh. From the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. If God's word is in there, yes. and fully and abundantly in there, then when I'm faced in a situation where I need to stand and preach the gospel on the mountaintop, preach the gospel in the housetop, preach the gospel anywhere, his word will automatically come out because it's in the abundance of my heart, as Sister Jeanette testified that Wednesday night. Do I love the Lord God? In Mark, the 12th chapter, in the 30th verse, and thou shalt love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. Do I love God that much that every part of my being loves him, appreciates him, longs for him? What do you mean? It means that sometimes I may be intellectually weak and I'm not sure I can speak the words that are going to sound right enough to the questions that are being asked out there. But I don't need to just rely on my intellect. I love God in my heart. So then in my heart and my love for Jesus, I can strengthen my mind when my mind needs to be strengthened. But maybe my heart is down today. And maybe I'm, I'm saddened today. I can look to the intellect of my mind and be renewed in the spirit of my mind and reach for that faculty myself. Or maybe, just maybe, I don't feel like it and I don't think about it. Maybe I just need some brute strength from this physical body. Now I'm going to force myself down on my knees and I'm going to force myself to lift up my hands and let the Spirit of God. Why? Because I love Him with all my heart. I love Him with all my soul. I love Him with all my strength. And if one of them are down and out, I'm going to reach to the other part of myself and let it carry me through. Let it carry me 
faith back down to the altar one more time, to all my knees one more time, to cry out to Jesus one more time, to receive that strength one more time. This is the Lord speaking to Paul about the church of Corinth in Acts 18th chapter. And this is my key scripture today that God has ministered and spoke to my heart. As Paul went to establish this church, he went there and there's those that wouldn't, wouldn't believe in what he was saying, those that, uh, well, you can look it up, just thought it was nonsense and didn't want to hear what he was going to say. And Paul's about to, as it says in the word, he was going to dust, wipe the dust from his feet and move on. And he had this vision in the night and it said, be not afraid. There it is again. Be not afraid, but speak and hold not thy peace. Praise the Lord. Prophet Jeremiah said it was like a fire that was shut up in his bones. Lord, that's my prayer today. Let it be a fire shut up in my bones that I can't contain it, that I got to speak it out. Let my heart be so full of your word and so full of your goodness that when I open my mouth, the good things of the Lord are spoken. Let me not hold my peace, but let me speak that gospel message. Well, isn't that just for... For the pastors, isn't that just for the preachers and the directors and the teachers and the Sunday school teachers and the children's church directors and those that are on Bible study? That's for them. They're the ones that are supposed to sow the seed. The Word of God talks about the sower of the seed, right? Does it say that the sower of the seed was a preacher? Does it say that the sower of the seed was a pastor? Does it say that the sower of seed was an evangelist? Does it say that the sower of seed was any respecter of any type of person or title that we want to put on it? No, it says the sower. What is a sower? Sower is somebody that has some seed and is going to sow it. That's it. There is no special title. There is no special thing that goes with it. It's somebody that has some seed, the seed of the good word of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and is going to take that seed and spread it out. That is the sower today. It is you and it is me. And I was thinking about this. Well, yes, our pastors and the ministry, they come to the house of God on Wednesday evenings and on Sunday, and they're sowing your seed. They're sowing your seed of the word, and those that receive it, receive it. They have no idea what type of soil you are. They have no idea if if it's your mind, your heart, your body, what's going on inside of you. But they sowed the seed anyway. They sowed the seed anyway. And I was thinking about this. Even Sister Eva and I, we have a uh, backyard. Isn't that crazy? (laughs) We have a backyard. And in this backyard, there's hardly any grass. There's hardly any grass, and we were talking about, well, hey, we're going to get some sod. We're going to get some sod. So the, you know, the cost of sod, I'm not going to spend the money on those sod. Let's get some seed. Seed it. We decided we're going to seed it. And so we go out there, and I guess we got to break up the soil a little bit. So I'm out there raking it up, and we got some seed, and I don't know. There's like so many different kinds of seed you could buy. I didn't do that much research. And so what are we doing? We're out there, we're not special, we don't have a title, I don't have the authority of the Apostle Paul or anything like that, but I'm there in my backyard and I'm sowing seed. And the Lord ministered in my heart and said, where is your backyard? My backyard is my place of work. My backyard is where I go to school. My backyard is where I have friends that may not be members of the church. My backyard is all those places that I go. And that is where I'm going to sow the seed. I don't know what kind of soil it is, but that is where I need to to sow the seed. All those places that I frequently. If there are those in the scripture, if they had not have spoken the word, if they had not have sown the seed, what would have happened? Here's an example in Acts, the 18th chapter, in the 26th verse. Aquila and Priscilla. Their names are mentioned in the Bible, but it doesn't say they're apostles. It doesn't say they're preachers. It doesn't say they're anything. You know what it says? It says they're tent makers. They're tent makers. They're sheet metal men. They're waitresses. They're waiters. They're insurance people, right? They're software people. Is this ringing? Is it because it's going bad? They're all these things, right? Just tent maker. I'm just a, I'm just a sheet metal estimator. Sowing the seed. And when they heard Apollos come and speak, Apollos had not heard about the baptism of Jesus. He had not heard about Jesus. He was speaking and preaching about the baptism of John. And they pulled him aside 
and say, hey, let me tell you what, of a more perfect way, a more complete way, the fullness of the same gospel message that was preached at the beginning, they spoke to him and changed his life. In Acts the 28th chapter and the 21st verse, this is Paul in Rome. And, and this, this scripture is pretty much anywhere Paul went, this took place. Anywhere Paul went to talk about the gospel message, this took place. And it says in the 21st verse, And some believed the things which were spoken, and some believed not. But had he had not spoken it, those who believed it would have not have received the message. How do I contend? I speak the message of Jesus Christ. How do I fight? I speak those things. I don't know what the soil is. I don't know that who is going to receive it. It says in John, the 8th chapter, in the 47th, 47th verse, but he that is of God will heareth God's words. And I'm butchering the scripture up. You therefore hear them not because you are not of God. Those who are not of God, those who are not going to receive God's message, are not going to receive it. Those who are of God, those who are hungry and thirsting for righteousness, they are going to hear the gospel message that comes out of my mouth if I will speak it. But they're going to think that I'm stupid. They're going to think that I'm ignorant. I'm not very eloquent. I'm not educated. I'm not any of those things. I'm just a sheet metal guy, right? All I do is cut tin. All I do now is color pictures on a drawing. Uh, Lily asked me what I do for work. I said I color pictures on a drawing and count it. That's all I do. <laughs> yes. It's probably a little more complicated than that art, right? But not for me, though. It's about that. I color. I color. That's what I do. I color. Let's get back to what I was saying. In Acts, the fourth chapter, in the 13th verse, backstory, it's uh, Peter and John go up to the gate, beautiful, and the man was looking to receive something from him, and he looked upon them, and he said, what? Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, give I thee, right? In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. He jumps up. He's walking. Everybody around is just freaking out because they've seen this guy begging at the gate for all this time. And what does he do? He throws his arms around Peter and John. And here they go just a hopping and a skipping and a joy and the goodness of the glory of the miracle that Almighty God has done. And they go into the church and into the tabernacle and just in the elation of God's spirit and this great healing, talking about the good things of the Lord, talking about everything. And the Sadducees and those that were in charge don't like what's going on. So what they do is because it was evening time, they throw all three of them in jail, throw them in prison, and then bring them back out of jail the next day. And, they, and this previous scripture says that Peter, being full of the Holy Ghost, full of God's spirit, full of God's word inside of him, begins to speak to them because uh, they want to know, hey, by what power are you doing this? And whose name has this thing been done? That this, and, and here's this guy that was healed right there next to Peter and John. And it said that they could say nothing. They could say nothing about what Peter was saying. In the 13th verse, it says, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled. It doesn't matter that I'm ignorant. It doesn't matter that I'm not eloquent of speech. It doesn't matter that I can't talk and say my words right or I trip up on my own tongue. It doesn't matter. What matters is the power of Jesus Christ inside of me and me speaking the message of the gospel of truth just like it was shown here. It didn't matter. They couldn't say anything against it. So then they punished them and then they rejoiced in their persecution and punishment because they said, should we rather obey you or obey God? We're going to obey God. And then they gloried in God because they were punished for it. Being full of the foolish. Well, I might be called foolish. They might think I'm a, I'm a, I'm a foolish, ridiculous person. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord when I say something about the goodness of the gospel message that Jesus loves you, that he died on the cross for you, and that he rose again on the third day, and they say you are a fool, and it is ridiculous. Praise God. Why? Because in 1 Corinthians, the first chapter in the 23rd verse, but we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, unto the Greeks foolishness, and unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, for many are called, but few are chosen, right? But they said, 
that I was foolish because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Amen. Call me fool all you want because it is more powerful than anything that you have. But God has chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise things. They, they were learned in the scripture and in the word and they could not stand and argue the presence and the words of the gospel message that Peter spoke to them. Because God has chosen the weak things of this world to confound those things that are mighty and the base things of the world, those things which are despised. And God has chosen, yea, even the things which are not to bring to naught things that are. Amen. Praise the Lord that no flesh shall glory in his presence. First Corinthians, the second chapter in the first verse. It is not about excellency of speech. It is not about how eloquent I am. It's not about how educated I am or not. It says, and I, brethren, when I came to you, this is Paul speaking, said, I came not with excellency of speech, of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not in enticing words of wisdom. It's not in great orations. It's not in all these things. Uh, Lord, I, I'm not even going to be able to do that. I'm, I, I don't even fall into that category. But it was in the demonstration of the Spirit and in power. In the example that we used, it was Peter being full of the Holy Ghost. Maybe he was a slight bit feared because he was in front of the high priest, but the Spirit gave him boldness and he was able to stand up and speak those words. I may not be in front of the high priest. I may not be in front of a, a, a panel or anything. It may be me at the water cooler. It may be me in line at the grocery store. It may be me at a friend's house. It may be me at school. And I need to let God's spirit and his word inside of me speak through me and be a useful vessel and speak that Jesus loves you. Praise the Lord. And I don't care if you think I'm a fool and I don't care if it's not eloquent enough and I don't have the right words. Jesus loves you and he died for you. And you know what? Even if you don't love him, he still loves you. But my speech, by the power, that your faith should not stand in wisdom of men. I'm not here to entice you with the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Let the power of God, like we talked about, burn inside of me. Let his spirit resonate in with me, not in excellent speech, not in enticing words, not in any great wisdom. Let the gospel truth just be spoken with somebody filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. The word of God says the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. It's the Spirit yes. in the words. The words are truth. The words are Jesus Christ. As we're standing in the house of the Lord, my closing point is this. In Esther, the fourth chapter, in the 14th verse, For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and their deliverance arise to the Jews from another place, but thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed and knoweth not whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this. I want you to just take a quick moment and I want you to look around at everybody in the building. You know, it was more, it was more than just fasting three days. You have to read this, the, the, the story on your, on your own time. It was more than just fasting three days. It was more than Esther just standing and approaching the king and whether he would raise his scepter or not. It was more than the banquet. It was more than all those things. All of those things would have meant nothing had Esther not spoken the words through her mouth. When I look, I don't see Esther here. I don't see Ruth here. I don't see Deborah here. I don't see Daniel. I don't see Samuel. I don't see King David. I don't see the Apostle Paul. I don't see Peter. If there was a mirror in front of me, well, I could see myself right there on that screen. I see me here. I see you here. We are here 
because God has called us and chosen us to be here at this time. For this time. For such a time as this. And it's not about just showing up. It's not about just being there. It's about speaking the gospel message. Speak and hold not thy peace. For I am with thee and no man shall set any hurt upon thee. For I have much people in this city. Praise the Lord. As the praise team come in at this time, with every head bowed and eye closed, and we think about these things. As they begin to sing this song, I thank you for those that are online for tuning in with us today. Just ask that something was said would minister to your heart. If you have a special need, Please send us your need and we'll lift up the name of Jesus on your behalf and ask God to move and minister into your life. God bless you. Join us again at the next appointed time. What a wonderful message today. And we hope that something that has been said or done has been a blessing to you and your family. Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, is alive and well today and by him all things are possible. So if you have a prayer request, please email us at prayer at mastershouse.org. Our senior pastor and assistant pastors will go before the Lord on your prayer request and pray God's perfect will be done in your life. Where two or more agree, there is Jesus in the midst. And when Jesus is in the midst, there is no limit to what he can do. And if you're new and you want to be a part of the Master's House ministry, please visit our website at mastershouse.org slash I'm dash new. And click the stay connected so you can be notified of all the upcoming events, outings, and activities that happen here at the Master's House as we strive to spread the gospel message of Jesus Christ around the world. May God bless you and keep you, and we hope to see you again at our next service.